happy day. Okay, hi, thanks so much for being with us. Um, there isn't anybody in this room or at this conference uh, who doesn't have a vested interest in targeting. And what I mean by targeting is very refined, permission-based targeting that gives you an absolute value added um, connection to the consumer. And the one thing that we've kind of all been dancing around at this conference, and by the way, at any other conference you go to, is understanding that uh, the keystone to the digital media age that we're living in is interactive connections, consumer relevancy. It's all about what the consumer wants. And of course, what we're used to talking about is what we want, what advertisers want, what media companies want, um, but it's really all about what the consumer wants. So the value proposition here about targeting that we're going to be discussing here in 30 seconds flat is that the more consumers reveal about their interests and their needs, the more effectively makers of content, product, goods, and services can make that information, that very specific, individual specific information, uh, the foundation for a continuous relationship, okay, with individuals, not with groups, not with big demographics, but with individuals. And that's an ongoing relationship that is mined, and that eventually will uh, render the one thing everybody's after, which is a transaction. And if you're lucky, it'll be many transactions. So that is, in, in essence, the kind of targeting that I think ultimately we're looking to achieve. Now, the big question, of course, is how we get from where we are now to that objective. And quite frankly, I think we're too far off the, the target of using interactivity to get there. So what I have asked um, our experts here, the expert panel, and they all have backgrounds, and they're, all of their companies are innately involved in this um, targeting issue. Uh, what I've asked them to do is give us their one best idea on how to get from where we are now to permission-based, refined, consumer-centric uh, targeting, okay, so that we can make that the foundation of the new digital economy. So I'm going to start with Dave Morgan. Um, he's CEO of Simul Media. I Skip know. the intros. Everybody will know who they are. No, no, no. I'm giving. I'm, that's the intro, Spencer. Okay. That no, is the, it. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm just asking them to give us our, their one best idea as the basis of a conversation that I hope you'll all participate in. So, Dave, go ahead. Well, I think I've been in targeting in the online world for the last 15 years or so, and I think that the first thing is to walk before we run. And so much of the focus on targeting is about what's possible and being perfect and not giving better relevance. About doing the rifle shot rather than, I mean, I come from the, the mountains of western Pennsylvania, so I know what this means. It's, what you do want to do is take the shotgun blast of marketing we have today, and we just want to start pulling it in and making it better. And when you try to be perfect, you have privacy issues, technical issues, and market engine, you know, sort of market engineering issues. And so, mm -hmm. Walk before we run. Absolutely. Okay, and I'm going to take up the privacy issue afterwards. Okay, let's go to Brian Shin, who's CEO of Visible Measures. Uh, well, I I just totally like to echo that. I mean, obviously, um, Dave is a, an expert in the targeting space, and I think he really knows it from experience. We're seeing that in the space too. That people are trying to do. Um, you know, brands are really interested in exploring and experimenting with a lot of really advanced techniques, but yet just dipping their toe into the basics of being able to do behavioral targeting, retargeting, things like that. That's something that people are just now really adopting in mass with companies like Audience Science and um, AOL, et cetera, you know, things like what Tumor is doing. So we think that it's incredibly important to have a foundation to build off of and mm -hmm. to, um, to hone the focus in from there. Okay. Uh, Calvin, uh, CEO of Tumor. So uh, I, my, my great new idea is actually probably a step back in the old idea. How about we start with coordination? Uh, a lot of times what we do is we get so caught up in the details of how do I do targeting, how do I buy media, how do I do my data segmentation, how do I find the right audience. But at the very basic beginning point is how do you marry the art and the science? Once you find these people, what are you going to say to them? So there's so many times that we work with advertisers and brands and agencies that fundamentally the media buying practice and the creative process are disjointed. What you're actually developing in your creative has nothing to do with who you're buying against. 
So my big idea is actually let's start from the very beginning. What are you going to say to whom and marry those two concepts together? Okay, great. Stefan. Thank you. Uh, well, all of us sitting here are in the so-called relevance business and uh, since many years we invested in data collection and statistical models and rule-based systems and so on. And suddenly, within the last two years, I think the picture completely changes because what we see at Facebook and Twitter and so on is that people start to engage themselves, to interact really massively. And uh, my conclusion uh, is and my idea is that we have to replace the algorithms, the machines with the user because the user is the new algorithm for targeting of the next generation. We have to let them participate and uh, add them to our targeting models. That's what we have to face in the future. Okay, so uh, let's take privacy first. Is too much being made of the privacy issue? I mean, you know, if consumers buy into the idea that they're going to share with you the most important information about the things that are most relevant to them, because by the way, they're just getting what is relevant to them in return. They don't have to deal with all the clutter. Then the privacy issue is moot, isn't it? Well. I don't think so. I, I don't think most people would say that. I think there's three things that have to be dealt with to deal with the privacy issue. One, you have to, we have to put the user or the viewer in the center mm -hmm. and they have to get explicit value. Mm -hmm. And in most cases today, and this is sort of the Walt Mossberg rule and I believe in this, he's like with all these great technologies, how come I still get absolutely terrible awful ads every time I go to a website? So we, we're not giving fewer or more relevant ads in any kind of scale today that's avail that visible to the viewers. And in many cases, a lot of companies are not giving any kind of notice and choice. People don't really know what's happening behind the scenes and what data is being harvested, and they don't really have a lot of choice. And I think that those things will have to be dealt with because we're seeing governments, and we just saw this in, in Europe now with the new cookie rule, right. the, yeah. are, are, are taking steps today. Right, and so to avoid government intervention, nobody wants that, um, we've got to get the technology in there and uh, put it to use. So who has those silver bullets? What companies are using them? Why aren't they using them if they're out there? In order to make the relevancy data available and to act on it. Well, I, I think the, the thing about this whole ecosystem is just, um, the amazing thing about it is just how many participants there are and how many people are working together to try to figure this problem out. I think that um, you know, Visible Measures is fundamentally a company that counts stuff and um, you know, we track a lot of stuff and we have to do it in a, in a way that um, is completely uh, without personally identifiable information, otherwise we, um, we can't exist as a business. And I think that sharing this information in a very open and transparent way, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that is um, essentially the direction that everyone is going. I think everyone is trying to do things that are geared toward providing value to the user. So I think the coordination and the co uh, collaboration between so many parties I think is incredibly evident in this space. You I know, definitely agree I'll, with I'll that. Um, I mean, the reality is uh, what, what, what Dave said at the very beginning is uh, when you think about all the ways that people are collecting data, all the privacy issues, at the end of the day, are all the companies in the ecosystem going to deliver a promise at the end of the day to the consumer? Mm -hmm. uh, if you collect all this information, are you bringing an experience that makes a difference to the consumer so they actually feel that they got value out of that? And that's incredibly hard to do unless you actually take a look at all the different layers coordinate amongst all different partners, and then really put the, the consumer at the middle. But you know, what I feel, guys, I'm gonna play devil's advocate here for a minute. What I feel is that we're all playing against the clock here. You know, everybody talks about needing to take action, needing to um, make things happen. Yes, it's out there, we're all working together, but while we're all talking about it, it's not happening, and the consumer is moving forward. You know, ever pushing forward, past the recession, you know, Everybody thinks that a lot of things will come back to where they used to be, that the spending will be what it was. Of course it's not. And so when we wake up to that new reality in 2010, okay, are we, are we playing against a clock in a game that we can't win? Doesn't somebody have to make the first move and start to make things happen? Honestly, I agree totally to what Dave said. So the user has to be in the center of what we do. And, mm -hmm. and uh, honestly, this was not always the case. You know, we develop machines, algorithms, uh, everything behind the scenes so it wasn't transparent and we didn't we didn't take the chance to let the users participate and tell us what what uh, what they really want and as if you see today that there are already web websites that receive more traffic from Facebook than from Google this really tells you that there is a huge change going on mm -hmm. so so the really 
relevant engines out there are the users themselves. Mm -hmm. And we have to cope with that. We have to make that uh, accessible for intelligent and smart marketing services. Now, you know, one of the things also, one of the other dynamics is that um, we have a lot of M&A starting up, okay? And that's going to change the landscape as well. And when you have uh, something like, if it does come to pass, an NBC, Universal, Comcast, you've got all the baggage that goes with that in terms of consolidating and working out the cultures and everything else. That said, does that set this process back simply because these guys are major players and they have issues of their own? Well, yeah, yeah, yes, I think it does. I mean, certainly when, when you have large corporate transactions and you may have talk of long-term synergy, mm -hmm. there's nothing that's more important for the next 18 or 24 months than how do you actually um, integrate those companies and manage them. But I think that we are going to see your sort of call to action. I do think we're going to see it now over the next couple of years as the techniques that have been developed in the online world now start moving into offline. Okay. And we're starting to see a lot of the techniques. I mean, I mean I'm, I've, I'm now in the television world and we have mobile. So, so we're finding things that have been proven on the PC world and we're going to start seeing the TV world and the mobile world. And ultimately, I mean, with the, the interesting gadget that our, our friend from China showed earlier, you know, clearly there's lots of ways that you can leverage data from print and other things. And well, so give us an example, though, Dave. Like, say, in the, um, the TV space, for instance, whether it's broadcast yeah. or cable. Well, you know, today, we have an infrastructure, like in the United States, you can target a different ad to 4,400 different geographic zones in the country. Mm -hmm. Now, I come from northern Appalachia, and now I live in the upper west side of Manhattan. And I'll tell you, people are very different in those areas. <laughs> no. Imagine that. <laughs> but we all get the same ads. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason for it. So when people talk about giving addressability to an individual television set, it's not needed today because just giving a better permutation and combination of ads and using you know, dynamic creatives and giving different ads in different parts of the country where they care about different things. Um, and that can be done today. And I think in, we're going to see a lot of that in the next, the next couple of years here. OK, but one more point. To drill down a little further, how do you get it down to that hyper-local individual pushing out the data, pu yeah. pushing in the, the relevant ads and, and whatnot. Well, well, what, it, tell me what players are going to make so, that happen. So the one thing that exists in the television world even today is that while the set-top boxes are not really very good computers, mm -hmm. they do actually record quite a bit of data that's anonymous. And so in the United States, there's more than 100 million set-top boxes that have some sort of data, and mm -hmm. 50 million of, that, of them can actually provide data back. So you can look at data in those 50 million set-top boxes and realize you can separate the person from the program and start understanding the kinds of content they want. And then you can build models just like we built in the online world to determine which more relevant ads could be delivered to those different homes. And you can deliver those out, and you can use a lot of classic marketing A-B control tests to determine did we sell more cans of Coca-Cola or mm -hmm. did more cars you know, get delivered here. And so I think we've seen the agencies start to take these technologies and starting to use them across their entire platforms of business, mm -hmm. like some of the things that like Joe showed us earlier. And so these pieces are coming together. And why I'm excited about TV is now we're dealing with two more zeros. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, to your point, Comcast got its hand slapped a couple of years ago for you know using some of this data. Now things were very different as as little as 18 months ago. Are all of you finding that there's still some reticence? on the part of, uh, say, the offline or traditional media players to get into this game? Or do, are their backs against the wall and they realize they have to? I actually think that, they, that, that uh, the reticence is, is lowering because people are starting to understand the technologies and the, and the capabilities much okay. more. Uh, but also, when you think about some of the things that were shared on the panel just uh, uh, 10 minutes ago, mm -hmm. it is a walk before you run. Yeah. Uh, you, can, you don't have to do the perfect execution down to every single uh, individual point of data. Uh, it's just something like Dave said. I mean, let's start with regional. Let's start with major audience clusters and mm -hmm. just make sure that the messages to the right people get delivered and you will get lift from that. Uh, and as we progressively get better and better and better and, and, and consumers start understanding what is happening and they start seeing the value of what we're doing, uh, then you're going to get be able to do more refined executions over time. Okay, but Brian? we don't have to get there right away. Okay, Brian and Stefan, tell me. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think some of the pressure, though, if you kind of take it from a, a different perspective and, 
and think about what the brands are feeling. Mm -hmm. I think the brands are really feeling a lot of anxiety in the space. I mean, as are media companies. And everyone's really just trying to understand what's going on. And when you think about the consumer being at the center of everything, I think we've all pretty much echoed that. Um, what that really indicates is that now the brands are in control of the consumers, the brand perception, the brand, uh, a lot of the brand influence is coming now from the consumer community. So you see this uh, huge, uh, um, uh, tremendous uh, volume of activity in terms of the social space. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at things like um, NBC Comcast, it's really focused on trying to, to lock in a lot of the premium subscription revenue uh, tied to carriage fees and try to uh, bring that online but still uh, you know, kind of keep that walled garden approach. I think what you're seeing in the social space is going to converge. And so you'll mm -hmm. have social video, you'll have the distinction between premium content being you know, very, um, you know, very hard to see a real classic distinction between premium and, and user generated. And um, the brands are going to have to embrace this. And what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to understand that there is um, a lot that they can do to interject into the conversation and influence it. Mm -hmm. But the brand perception is now is in uh, the hands of the consumer. And that's something that I think all of us are dealing with where we're taking that consumer information, that consumer behavior, we're trying to apply it um, to en enable a better consumer experience. But I think the brands are really struggling to understand how to embrace that social aspect of their brand. Okay, and Stefan, what are you finding here in Europe? Yeah, uh, I, I have two figures. It's five and 50 percent. Uh, <laughs> and uh, 5% is, on average, the number of campaigns across Europe that are run with uh, intelligent targeting right now. And to everyone you talk in the industry, uh, either if it's you know, the, the Proctor guys or guys from media agencies or marketers, they say that the real potential is every second campa campaign should be run with targeting. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to those guys, uh, there, are, there are two major reasons. One is they don't feel safe. You know, and uh, I, this guy from, from Unilever said to me, I always, if I book a targeting campaign, I have the feeling that I, that I, I go to, to court. I have to go to court mm -hmm. for that, you know, because uh, I don't feel safe about it. And I'm absolutely, you know, worried about what my clients, my customers would think okay. about it. Uh, and the other, uh, the other point, it's, it's still way too complicated, you know. There mm -hmm. are many targeting services and techniques and geo and this and that. And what they, th what they want is simply their audience. You know, they want GFP campaigns uh, for their audience just as they used to do it on television. That's what we have to face to reach the 50% uh, as soon as possible. Okay, so before we go to audience questions, and I really hope you have some, last question. When do we make the shift? How long is it going to take to, in order to build the digital economy, go to pricing and creating value around the consumer data the, con the specific consumer connection versus, you know, in order to price marketing and, and content exposure versus, say, the page views or all the other stuff we use now? How long? I think it's already starting. Okay. Um, it, it certainly is, is, is uh, not the majority of executions, mm -hmm. but it certainly is starting. I mean, if you take a look at all the real-time environments that are coming out, take a look at the great work that companies like uh, Media Math and what Joe's doing, uh, are doing, uh, mm -hmm. things that what we're doing, mm -hmm. uh, things that are listening to what audience actually do based upon that, like uh, what Brian's company are doing. It's all starting right now, and the question is, how many layers will there be and how are they going to all coordinate? And actually, unlike uh, Dave, I actually think M&A will actually help bring that together much faster. When you have so many different players in the ecosystem, there's going to be always a little bit of trepidation about like, how much do I do with this person versus that person versus that person, and how do you do that one plus one equals 11? Yeah. Uh, and a lot of times, it takes someone to bring them together and buy them and say, like, hey, this is how we're going to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. I mean, it's going to happen. It's not going to happen because suddenly the market accepts a higher level of data and values. It's going to happen because we, we see a market participant or two mm -hmm. change the business model. And so yeah. I actually think we're not going to see media sold with data on top. Mm -hmm. right. We're just going to see performance being sold. Exactly. Because the problem with media is it was based on a scarcity of distribution model where exposure was valued and is no longer valued. It's now results. So I think the media companies are going to become more integrated, and they're not going to sell data. They're going to sell results. Because then you don't have to change behavior a lot, and you get rid of the complication. Instead of saying, don't you want to buy this really statistical, cool, actionable insight model on top of my media? Or yeah. how about I sell you, you know, 5 right. million more customers next month, and you're going to pay me a dollar or two per customer? Yeah, absolutely. And if there's money behind it and... Your other revenues are going down. Your decisions made for you, right? Okay, questions from the, yes, Esther. Uh, yeah, can we get a mic there? Thanks, sorry. By the way, Diane, you got six minutes. Great, so, okay. so I just want to start out. Imagine 
a very politically incorrect scene. There's a guy, he shows up, he's in a wheelchair. There's somebody behind him pushing him along and someone else comes up and says, do you think he wants a glass of water? And the person pushing the chair says, yeah, he likes water, why don't you get him some water? Nobody asks the guy in the wheelchair, what, what do you want? want? Yeah. Uh, your problem is not privacy, it's not data. All the stuff you're doing is great, but the, the issue that the US Federal Trade Commission cares about more than in Europe, where they are much more paternalistic, they don't ask the consumers either, is not what you do, it's what, how well you disclose what you do. Right. There are some companies working on better disclosure. Google just came out with its personal history tool. Mm -hmm. the, the attention you pay to generating data for advertisers, you could also generate data for the user. This is what we know about you, this is why we're showing you this ad. Most users couldn't care less. But if you start with that kind of disclosure and transparency, suddenly people will get off your case. Mm -hmm. right. uh, people don't care about relevance of ads. They do care if they think you're deceiving them. Right. Uh, uh, that's a question, of course. David. <laughs> <laughs> and a great one. Well, I, I'm, uh, you know, Esther, you know, I've talked about this a number of times before. I mean, I'm participating in a few, a few weeks in an FTC process on this. And you're right. In other words, I, I think the, inno the most innovative companies, I think that uh, Craig Newmark said, trust is the new black, and I really believe in that. I think that data is not power, trust is power, and we're going to see companies use data first to deliver better results, but when they have a, you know, if, if they can create, if they can be empowered by the consumer or empower the consumer, they can win. We, it's just, it's all, you know, it's a question of implementation. Right. I think it's, I, I think it's a fantastic question also. Um, you know, one of the things that, it, that companies have begun to do is to proactively enable opt-out network-wide. Uh, that's something that we've done. I think a lot of our um, you know, compatriots have done the same thing. And in terms of trying to inform the users in terms of um, what it is, like, hey, here's why we're showing you a great ad, et cetera, we're not in the ad serving business, but one thing that we've tried to do on an aggregate level is to try to show here's what the aggregate internet video audience is consuming and here's what they seem to like. And it's based upon tracking everybody, but doing it in a very aggregate, anonymous way. And so we, we basically just published top 10 lists, which is a really, really simplified version of um, at least our intention of trying to be very open about um, what it is that we're doing with people. That's not enough to get you to the promised land. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I think we're, we're, in, we're, not, we're like not even 2% of the way there, but I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to be proactive about um, privacy, and I think yeah, all these guys have been it. innovators um, you know, for so long in terms of trying to do that. We're just trying to follow some of the great examples led by others before us. Yeah, Stefan, you were going to say? Yeah, of course, it's a great question, and I've been in discussion with a lot of guys from the European Commission that are driving the things on the European side right now. And one interesting thing about, you know, being transparent and leaving the choice to, to the guy in the wheelchair is that if you show people and tell them what we really do, all of us sitting here, it's drastically less scaring than everyone thinks, you know. Uh, we collect drastically less data. There is no personal identifiable data. The industry has no need for that, you know. And uh, we care a lot more about what we do uh, than what people think out there, but it's our fault, you know. We have to be more transparent tell more what we do. That's definitely a point. Yeah. Another question. Yes, sir. Um, oh. yeah, yes. Um, Twelve years ago, trying to sell banner ads um, for a commercial website to agencies, and it was a thrill a minute because it was really hard to find the person who had geographic responsibility for the internet, and uh, along, with bu along with budget. So they were interested in this stuff, but they didn't have the organizational structure to really take action against that. So in a perfect world, where you have a good good data customer, what kind of organization would you like to see in them to where they can actually make the best use of that? Well, typically you need a company that actually sells to consumers. One of the biggest problems in working with a lot of the big advertising brands are they actually don't have consumer relationships. They have distributor relationships. So the car companies, the consumer packaged goods companies, they don't really know who their consumer is. It's right. such a distance from them, and data is more of a power and leverage. And I mean, I, a good friend of mine ran a big marketing department at one of the large consumer packaged goods, and he said, you know, I'm, I'd be much more likely to be fired for walking outside of the yellow line during a fire drill than doing a bad marketing plan. Mm -hmm. He said, because we're a manufacturing company, not a marketing company. And, and it's, it's a social engineering problem. It's finding companies that actually know who their consumers are and know how to talk to them. Absolutely. Well, last question, please. No, well, last well, question, please. All right. So uh, in the new world, Fast user question. become to be the, 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 in the center. Everything come to me. 
I will have tools that allow me to target the brands and find information that I want. The question is how you are going to offer to user uh, the value that they want to get, that their tools that they will have, that the human filter will basically bring them to this specific value that you offer them. Here's a, here's a point, you know, if you, uh, just a few days ago I checked how many fans Nike has on Facebook mm -hmm. and it's close to 2 million right now. And Coke has more than 5 million fans on, on Facebook. And, and honestly, I, wouldn't, I would never have thought that something like that would happen, you know, that people start engaging with a brand, an, an FMCG brand that never had customer relationships. And that's, that's my thesis that we have to face that, you know, that's a huge challenge for guys like us because that's why I think users will replace the algorithms, you know. It's not only that the wheel, guy in the wheelchair will be asked, he will drive the business. He, he will decide what we will show him and we, ha we have to integrate this into our, in, into our systems and that's, uh, you know, that breaks up everything, you know, how we did it for the last 10 years. But it's a huge challenge and uh, very exciting as far as I think. I 